Hi everyone, I'm so honored to be here today at this conference and um, I think just the enthusiasm I already see in the room and the fact that so many of you came out today speaks very well of what the institution is going to achieve in the future as far as new and innovative ways of reaching our students and providing them with memorable and rich learning experiences. So, uh, as Jerry mentioned, I, I am a cognitive psychologist by training. Um, Most of my research background is in certain aspects of memory, uh, language, and communication. And I, you know, I teach undergraduate and graduate cognitive psychology. I also teach a little bit about the, uh, the mind and technology. Um, and lately, I've been working on trying to translate and extend many of our key research findings from cognition into the realm of teaching particularly innovative and technologically aided uh, methods of teaching. And you know, this is not a new thing. There are a lot of individuals out there today who are calling for us to base more of what we do in our classrooms and online classes on cognitive and brain sciences. Uh, however, I've been really struck by how hard it is to find uh, those extensions and applications that um, are new and usable, are reasonably up to date and accurately represent the science. So that's what I've really been trying to push to do. And today's session is going to be somewhat interactive, uh, so be ready for that. I'm gonna emphasize memory as a cognitive process in particular that we really wanna promote in our classrooms, although by no means am I claiming that that's the only thing we're trying to accomplish with our, with our teaching, memory for material. Just one very important thing. And of course, a lot of the processes and principles I'll talk about do extend into other realms of cognition as well. So my goal is for you today, uh, just echoing what Jerry said here, is first of all to spark your interest in how cognition and how people think, how that can guide our instructional design, help us make better choices and design decisions as we set up our courses and learning experiences. I wanna illustrate a couple of cognitive take-home principles in what I hope and believe will be a very memorable fashion. I wanna set you straight about what I see as a few persistent myths and misconceptions that hamper us as we try to apply what we know about the mind. And we're gonna get a little bit out of some people's comfort zones. I'm gonna take on some uh, kind of controversial topics. So get your rotten tomatoes ready. We're, gonna, we're just gonna have it go at it like that. And I do hope to leave you with some new and again, very usable insights um, that can help us refine the design and delivery of what we do online. All right, so starting right off the top here, if we're gonna talk about memory and how to build memory in practical contexts like teaching, um, it makes sense that we would want to, to start with memory theory, right? And uh, you know, these days if you read articles about uh, education and instructional design, a lot of them reference uh, learning theory, memory theory, or something like that. So um, let's take one on that you may have seen reference before. Right? So this is just one illustration of lots of different illustrations of this particular theory that you could, you could find. All right, so this is um, one that, that, again, you may have seen in one form or another. It's primarily associated with the memory researchers and theorists Atkinson and Schifrin who put this theory together. So in this concept of memory, it characterizes uh, memory <coughs> in terms of information processing. It's information passing through a series of stages which function almost like an assembly line. So um, you see here the first component is so-called sensory memory, right? The first box of this three, three component or three box theory. So the idea is that information comes into a, your first memory component, sensory memory, which holds a lot of information, but only very, very briefly. So it might hold a big a, a imprint of uh, visual information, or you also have an auditory sensory memory component as well. Uh, and the vast majority of what comes into sensory memory is lost. Okay, so that's the information leading out the bottom, so it's gone, it's it's bye-bye. Uh, it's um, a very small amount of it, though, is lucky enough to get transferred over to the next step in the assembly line, and that's short-term memory, all right? So short-term memory is a limited capacity store. Uh, it can only hold a little bit of information that you're actively working with. Uh, now, one, most of what uh, comes into short-term memory is also gone quite rapidly, but you see that little circle arrow at the top is the process known as rehearsal. So if you've ever kind of frantically repeated a phone number or something like that to yourself, um, you've engaged in rehearsal. And the idea here is that, especially if you've rehearsed something, 
he may be able to transfer it to that last and greatest stop along the assembly line, long-term memory. That's your vast repository of all that you know and all that you can retrieve and remember. And if you want to use the information, then you retrieve it and you dump it back into short-term memory and use it. Um, all right, so how many of you uh, feel like you have some familiarity with this idea? You've encountered this theory before. All right. Great, so the first thing I want you to remember about this theory is this. Okay. <laughs> so, this is a theory that launched a thousand other theories and, th and a thousand other research projects, but it in no way resembles the modern conception of how memory works, all right? So, um, Atkinson and Schifrin put this theory together based on their research back in the 1960s, and a great deal has happened since then to advance our understanding of how memory works. Now, unfortunately, uh, those modern and contemporary concepts of memory um, do not lend themselves to nice diagrams that fit on one slide and uh, are sort of grand unifying theories. They are more complicated and more messy than that. So perhaps this is why you still see the, the three box component theory reference so much. So virtually none of us believe that anymore that this is an accurate or comprehensive dis uh, description of how human beings remember. Um, so if you, I guess that's the first take home point for today. If you happen to be reading one of the, the uh, theory based approaches to teaching and learning, you know, it may be a good approach, maybe a bad approach, but if this is their theoretical basis uh, for what they're putting forth, you gotta be a little bit skeptical. Um, so here's, another though, very influential theoretical idea that I want to refresh for you here today. So this concept, the working memory theory, um, in a sense really supplanted that simplistic three box model, the assembly line model of memory. Um, it's by no means the only going theory of what's important about human memory, but it's, it's one that we still work with today. So pulling out a couple of key things about the theory of working memory. The idea is that, yes, there is some separation between what we'd say is the long-term memories, the things you're not at, using right now, and immediate memory. Um, but the twist here is that that immediate memory component, what we're working with in the here and now, is more complex and, in a sense, uh, smarter than what we originally thought. And many, many theorists, not all of us, but many believe that we have not one, but many different um, kind of situation-specific working memory components. Each one has a, a job of working with one kind of information to accomplish a task. So for example, you have a working memory component that's heavily tied into the language areas of the brain and of the mind, and its job is to hold word sounds. That's all it does. It's uh, involved, uh, for example, in, uh, in learning new words. So that's one component of working memory, and it's chugging away, doing its job. You've probably got another component whose job it is to uh, temporarily hold word meanings. So it holds abstract meanings of words just long enough for you to construct a representation of a sentence. So that's used in other aspects of language processing. You've got another component that holds visual and spatial information. So if you're doing a task where you have to visualize something, maybe rotate it in space or make a judgment about it, you're going to be relying on that working memory component. So these, all these different components are working together in a more or less coordinated fashion to accomplish tasks. It's not just one little bucket of, of memory that's uh, cycling things around. Um, all right, so moving along, here's another uh, theoretical idea, which you may also be familiar with. How many people <coughs> are seven plus or minus one in the context of memory capacity? All right, so this is a little, le little less, but uh, so there is this idea, you may have run across at some point, that working memory capacity is limited to about five to nine items. All right, so we ballpark at around seven items. And similarly, again, that, that rehearsing things is really what gets things into long-term memory. So this is based on some classic research, but it's research that primarily looks at memory for disconnected, non-meaningfully related items. So for example, a string of random numbers I give you and say, oh, tell these back to me. Or a string of words that I just sort of picked out of the database and see how many of those you can, you can remember. Uh, so while it's good to know about, this is another one that you probably shouldn't take literally. 
and that may not impact uh, learning in actual situations like what you'd see in a classroom or an online class. So for one thing, contemporary memory theorists know that a huge driving factor of what you're going to remember is not how many things you were presented with at once, it's meaning. So meaning is tremendously, tremendously important for memory encoding. Right? So, and I've seen this played out sometimes. I've seen, well, you know, only put seven bullet points on a slide because that's human working memory capacity. And I just kind of go, no, 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 no. Unless you really are getting students to memorize disjointed pieces of information, and I hope you are not, um, this is just not what, what's going to determine their memory for it. So, you know, to illustrate, you can think about, you know, there are situations where uh, you have capacity to take in an enormous amount of information, way more than seven pieces, under the right circumstances. So for example, uh, it's kind of a heavy example, but if you remember where you were the morning of September 11th, uh, 2001, then you know that you took in a huge amount of information in what may have been a, a matter of minutes or even seconds. Uh, now that memory is not perfect, it's not going to last forever, but it shows that when things are consequential, meaningful, and have an emotional punch, they stick. Forget about seven plus or minus one. Um, and you know, just in, a, in another little aside that's uh, perhaps a little bit depressing for some of us, um, contemporary memory theorists also say, you know, uh, if you take away people's strategies for, uh, for recall, um, our capacity estimates, they really just go down. So there are people today, really the going estimate is more like four items. So we're losing ground all the time. So you're talking about, uh, remember, how many disconnected things can you remember at once? Uh, many people say maybe four, if you're lucky. Uh, others say, well, you know what? Working memory is essentially whatever you can pay attention to at one time. And how many things can you pay attention to at one time? Oh no, all right, so, so we've gone from maybe eight to eh, five-ish to, well, four if you're lucky, to one thing. So um, I think that this gives us some perspective on another piece of received wisdom that many of us may have, have run across in memory research. And it also um, brings up another major theme I want to put to you today, and that is the role of attention, of actual attention. And I've gone out on a limb here, use some extravagant wording that attention is really the key to memory. So the more researchers are working on questions of why we remember what we do, how the memory system works, the more we realize that we maybe can't even talk about memory as separate from attention. And conversely, people who study attention say, you know what, I think a lot of what we're talking about is what we've previously thought of as working memory. So we maybe can't even separate what it means to pay attention from what it means to remember something. So attention and memory, more and more research projects are converging. You see more researchers looking at both. And that is something that I think impacts what we need to do as teachers and as designers of learning experiences. Now, you know, when it comes to attention, uh, attention is a great topic in cognitive psychology because among other things, we don't know how to define it. Now, we all know it when we see it, um, but nobody's come up with a nice, pithy, one-sentence uh, definition of what it means to pay attention, or uh, we also, there's no attention spot in the brain or anything like that. Um, but we have learned a great deal about the underpinnings of how attention works in the brain and how it's involved in different aspects of cognition. So, and just like with memory, um, the more we study other things we do, like reason, solve problems, and so forth, the more we realize that attention plays a role in all of those. So if you don't have attention, you don't have very much. So, that said, there does persist the, seem to persist this folk belief, especially among our students, I know it is with mine, that uh, you can remember things that weren't the subject of focused attention, right? It's gonna sink in and, you know, Terry referenced, oh, I'm gonna be texting, and somehow, magically, the information that's uh, being fo the focus at the front of the classroom is just gonna somehow get in there. And yes, we, we do have a pronounced tendency to overestimate 
um, what our attentional capacity capacity is. So for that reason, I think it's it's uh, productive to to um, turn to a rather striking demonstration of just what our limitations are and just how little that we remember when we don't have focused attention on a task. So I'm going to demonstrate to you something that you may have seen demonstrated before, but this is a very robust effect that uh, works even if you've seen it before. <laughs> so that's, that's always good for this type of situation. And this, is, so this effect is ch uh, called change blindness. <coughs> It was uh, discovered about 13 or 14 years ago by researchers named Rensink and uh, also Kevin O'Regan, who uh, put together the demonstrations I'm about to show, show to you today. Um, now, without saying too much about it before I give you a chance to look at it, I'm going to uh, really tempt fate here in a big, big way. I'm going to attempt to exit this program and go to the web and show you some web-based demonstrations. So, we so uh, Kevin O'Regan has these uh, available on his website, and you can uh, use that URL later, later if you want to look at these on your own. But what I'm going to be showing you are pictures, and you have a very simple task, even at this hour of the morning, everybody should be able to do this, and this is uh, to pick out what's changing. So really technically what you'll be seeing are pairs of pictures in which some element of, of the picture has changed, all right? So... All right, so some people will see it, some people won't. Don't say what it is. How many people notice the change that's occurring? Okay, so some do, some don't. Now, you'll notice that there's a, a bit of a flicker here. That's what we call it. And that's not an artifact of the presentation of the book. That's actually key to the effect. Now, if we take that away, it's, it's incredibly, incredibly easy to spot the change. Here's another one. I'll show you this. How many people spot the change? Don't say what it is. Okay, about a third will, and then we get a few more, and some of us will not see it for a long time. Now, if you weren't able to see it, it's this element of the picture down here. And that's a, just like with the, the changing reflection in the water that we just saw, that's a pretty big chunk of the picture. And it's not like it's hidden way over the edge or you physically can't see it. What Rensink and O'Regan and other researchers have, uh, have concluded after a lot of investigation of this startling effect is that this is all about disruptions to focused attention. So we subjectively feel like when we see a picture, yeah, I kind of remember what this picture is about. You know, I know what I'm looking at. And therefore, if something's changed, um, I'm going to notice it's going to contradict what I remember. And they're showing that this very brief disruption to focus attention kind of wipes out most of, of that picture, right? You think you're going to retain it, but you don't, not even over a fraction of a second. <coughs> now, here's one that probably will not provoke any change blindness, and I'll tell you why in a second. Okay, do we all see the change here? Yeah. All right, flicker's the same, but what's going on and what Renzi and O'Regan found is that um, elements that are what they call the central interest of the picture are immune to change blindness. Now, they, they looked at all different factors, and this is the one they centered on. Now, central interest of the picture doesn't mean it's in the middle. It means it's what, it's what the picture's about. It's why you're looking at the picture in the first place. So when you examine something with even just a little bit of focused attention, right, to help make sense out of that picture, Voila, now you do form a reasonably lasting memory representation. You might not remember it by lunchtime, but you'll remember it at least half a second from now. So this is one of the reasons why we say this is a specifically an attention and memory effect. And in, some, in a striking twist to this, they also showed that other disruptions to attention can sometimes produce this as well. So how many people see the change in this case? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> so they, they call this the mud splash paradigm. So there's this little distracting something that obscures part of the picture for a fraction of a second. How many people see the change? Okay, so some, some do, some don't. Um, so here's, again, something that's probably physically very close to the elements of the picture that you're attending to, but, uh, but it's not that meaningful, so we don't notice it. And just jogging your attention with these distracting mud splashes will produce that effect. 
All right, great. So we can go back to our go back to our PowerPoints at this point. Maybe Ella will help me out. So my here is not that your students are experiencing change blindness. That I, I don't. I mean, unless you're doing something very strange in your classrooms, I don't think that that is the case. The point is a broader one um, about disrupting that folk belief that we remember all kinds of things by mere osmosis and low effort, low investment processing, um, and to, to show you just how important that attentional factor is. So with that, I'm going to put it to you briefly. We're going to have a, a detour into some participation here and talk about, all right, if, if uh, attention drives memory. If you don't have anything without attention, then what are some practical techniques that, uh, that some of you have used and you can put out there to your colleagues um, that capture students' focused attention? All right, so who's going to be brave and put up their hand first? So what are some techniques that you've used to capture student attention? We can focus on online, but you know we do it in the traditional classroom as well, don't we? So what are some techniques for capturing focused attention from your students? Yes? Appealing design, like good colors, okay. good, good design. All right, all right, so drawing them in, drawing them in visually with certain visual design choices. All right, yes? A narrative, a good story that it makes sense uh -huh. and gives context. Yeah, so a narrative or a good story, and this is a good one to remember, uh, you know, other memory researchers have pointed out that there's something privileged about the story in human memory. Uh, that, that sticks far better than presenting the same information in other formats. So presenting a story or a narrative? Yes? Let them work on projects that they're interested in. Okay, so draw on a prior interest um, that will get directly towards a task, yes? Ask questions. Ask questions, yeah, ask questions. Relevant to what you're doing. Okay, ask questions, it relates to the task at hand, yeah. Put them in charge of presenting put them in charge of presenting, so yeah, move off and put, put more responsibility on them. Yeah? Uh, start arguments between students. Okay, <laughs> start <laughs> moderate arguments between. Debates, debates. Yeah, yeah, so get them attending to, to each other, either online or offline, and one more in the back, yes? Interactive activities. All right, so interactive activities, and, and I will, will second the interaction, the, the questioning, um, I think it's a relatively simple thing to do, but it's something we often can do, is requiring them to respond. Mm -hmm. So just like probably attention in here went way up when it went back out to you, uh, putting them on the spot that they are gonna have to do something to keep the action moving um, is a, just another practical way to redirect. So for example, if I have to, if I've got a, a lot of text that I want them to read, you know, that, that's fine, probably nothing wrong with reading text. Um, I would probably break it up online and have them stop out with either an opinion question, a comprehension question, anything that puts it back to them uh, before they've kind of, kind of spaced out on this long text. So some of these are very down-to-earth practical things, but they come back to this issue of, you know, without the students focusing on what you're doing, it's gone. Um, it it's simply evaporates uh, the same way some of those picture elements do. Now here's another uh, folk belief that I sometimes explore with students. And I ask them, well, why do you remember some things and not others? You know, why do some things stick in your memory and other things don't? They say, well, it's how many times I've, I've run into it. So if I see something or hear something a lot, uh, then I'll remember it. And you know, if it's just one time, I probably won't. And that's another belief we can put to the test. Now granted, you know, yes, there's some things about repeated exposure that are important. And certainly we have advertisers spending untold amounts of money just to put their ads in front of us over and over, and maybe they're onto something. Um, but uh, mere exposure is also surprisingly not, uh, uh, has, has very, very little power to create sticking power in memory. And so here's another one where I'd like us to all get involved. Do we all have pens and paper, those 20th century uh, technologies with us today? <laughs> I'm gonna ask you, I won't, I won't take them up. Uh, I'm gonna ask you to sketch out something from memory. Fortunately, it'll be something that you're very, very practiced with. So, you know, th this'll be fine. It's something that's highly familiar. We're gonna look at your memory for it as evidenced by your sketching ability. So what I would like everybody to draw is the front and back of a US one cent coin. 
a penny, all right? So no, no cheating. We're not going to plagiarize our pennies just yet. So let's see how you do at sketching out what's on the front and back of a penny. All right, I see some details going on paper. This is very promising. Okay, so if you've got some loose change on you, let's pull it out and check your work. Let's see, let's see how you did. I don't care anything small than your nipple. Either it's just awesome. It's useless. <laughs> Okay, so I'm guessing, having observed many students and, and others uh, attending this, a uh, little test of memory. I'm assuming that there were a fair number of discrepancies between what you put down and what's real. Okay, all right, so let's write out there. What, what were some things that were just wrong about your penny drawing? What, what was wrong? Yes? I put the pluribus unum on there and it doesn't appear anywhere on the coin. Wow, yeah, I thought it was on the G. Yeah, so, so it's floating around somewhere, shouldn't be. Uh, yes, what are some other discrepancies? Yes? All right, so the date's in there, but it's it's placed wrong. Yes, in the back. Uh, President Lincoln's facing the wrong way. Facing the wrong way. How many people have President Lincoln facing the wrong way? All right, so probably about, about half. So you're, you're about chance at even getting the head facing the wrong way. Um, I, and I've seen some, some real weird stuff through the years when, when I get, try to get my students to try this as well. You know, I've seen fancy top hats on Lincoln. I've seen kind of bow ties. I've, I've seen his little face, but no neck. And it's it, uh, very strange things. Strange things occur. Now, let me also put it to you. You probably have some strong and fairly good intuitions about why it is that you have handled a penny thousands upon thousands of times, and you don't really know what it looks like, right? So. Why do you think that you're placing elements wrong, you're moving them around, you're putting things that don't belong, leaving things out? Why do you think that you're so bad? Yes? It's just not important. Not important. All right. All right. So not important. The reasons. Yes? Overexposure. Hmm. Okay. Overexposure. And, it, what, and could you expand a little bit on what you mean by that? I think that when we see something so frequently, uh -huh. we tend to not pay attention to the detail. Okay. Yeah, so uh, there's sort of a paradox here where novelty can trigger uh, attention processing and therefore therefore memory and the, the lack of novelty <laughs> can sometimes work against us. All right, so not important, not novel. What are some other reasons? Yes? We understand it as being color and weight coded, the way mm. we interpret our money. Well, yeah. Yeah, so what's important, the important features about it and the way that we understand yeah, understand money tied to some, some other aspects of it. So you probably have a pretty good idea of the color and size. Yes? What you don't need to know. Don't need to know. The purpose of a penny is something different than looking at Yeah, so till today, nobody ever tested you. You might do better tomorrow <laughs> now that you've had to do it. Yes? Not frequently used. Yes, and we, you know, this demonstration may uh, start to lose its punch if we, uh, you know, in 10, 20 years <laughs> uh, where we aren't handling it as much. Um, but even those of us who have handled them, them many times, we, we find that we, we retain remarkably low of the information that's in front of us. Yes? I've never had to worry about counterfeit pennies. Yeah, <laughs> so if it's 100, we might give it a little bit, uh, a little bit more attention, but, you know, no, if, if, it's, if it's one penny, yeah, it could it could be from anywhere. We're we're going to be all right with it, right? So, 
you know, this too is um, a, a demonstration of a take home point about why we remember what we remember and getting away from this mere exposure, get it in front of them and they'll remember it idea. Uh, and what this is, actually, is a replication of a classic study by the psychologists Nickerson and Adams, who presented this in a much more systematic and controlled way to a group of US research participants and found the same thing. Actually, they found that about 2 thirds of their individuals had the head facing the wrong way and found the same suite of errors. And you know, it does, it's not an artifact of just having you know, bad drawing ability. If we were to set up an array of 20 plausible penny configurations, uh, it's very, very unlikely that you could reliably pick out the correct one. So even if you make a multiple choice, you still really do not know. Transfers into the auditory modality as well. Doesn't matter if it's visual or, or auditory. There's something about information that just kind of washes over us and does not tie into um, our goals and our interests and that we aren't put to the test um, that, can, that can really, really disappear. So, you know, that said, yes, engagement with information, effortful, attentive practice, yes, that's absolutely very, very important. And you may have seen um, some of the applied research out there uh, looking at the development of expertise and how that develops from focused practice, ideally practice with feedback and continued improvement. So that's crucial. Passive exposure, no. So um, here's one thing, though, where online teaching um, can provide us new avenues to the effortful practice that leads to memory um, that are hard or perhaps impossible to do in a traditional pencil and paper face-to-face -face environment. So uh, I'll give you um, an example from a project I've worked on with uh, one of my colleagues at my institution, Elizabeth Brower. She's a brilliant teacher and she's an electrical engineer. So she uh, actually is, spends her time and her passion at the very foundational level of electrical engineering classes. So, you know, as we talked about ways to develop teaching and bring in new tools, she said, you know, one of the key things at that level is that her students were uh, trying to do elementary circuit analysis and they were slow and inaccurate at applying some kind of building block principles of, of the discipline. You, you probably got some similar things in your own discipline. In her case, it's things like uh, Ohm's Law. There's something in uh, circuits that's Ohm's Law. So, you know, she's saying, yeah, they know what Ohm's Law is. Yes, they read it. But they can't, they don't have it down cold. So when they're doing one of these problems, their cognitive resources are all sucked up by kind of trying to recall that rule and apply it. And there's nothing left over for the higher order things that we want. So what we did is we set up um, some online, it was essentially online homework with a twist. So we set up um, assignments for students where they would come in and yeah, they, they do uh, different circuit analysis problems. Um, but the thing was, they were encouraged and pushed and exhorted to do them as many times as possible. And it was a different problem every time. You could do that online. You start with a different random number and it resets the whole problem in a new way. So instead of uh, the traditional uh, way of assessing knowledge, you're gonna come in and do one problem perfectly while I watch you, the idea is you get it lots and lots and lots of tries with feedback in an online environment. We also set things up so that students were graded, um, uh, not just on their accuracy, which would build as they did more attempts, but also on their speed. And that's something that we don't often do. So their final score would be a combination of how well did you do on your best attempt and how quickly were you able to do that. So building the, the skill and focusing students on this fact that yeah, you need to know these foundational things down cold, do them as many times as you need to um, in order to build that. And yeah, it does matter that you're not having to run to go Google what Ohm's Law was when you're trying to start the problem really tough to do without the capabilities of learning management systems. So, um, you know, this is something I think many of us intuitively know, that you have to have effortful practice to build expertise. That said, it's very easy for us to uh, get away from that in our designs. And one reason is because we are experts in our discipline. And experts have a pretty pronounced tendency to underestimate 
of just how much information and practice that a novice will need to start approaching that level. Um, so that is another thing we need to push um, to, the, to the forefront when we are setting up our, our learning experiences. Exploit the ability of online learning to keep presenting students with those problems. You know, we, we may think that they get it in three homework problems, maybe they need 30, maybe they need a couple hundred to start to approach where we are. And that's what we can, we can do better in an online environment. Switching gears here, here's another one that you sometimes see um, uh, promoted as a basis for why we should put more things in uh, an online environment, so why we should go to more online learning tools. And this is um, the so-called digital native uh, concept, or sometimes it goes by um, net generation. Um, so if I could just kind of try to summarize or characterize this idea. The idea is that students who have grown up in an environment of ubiquitous computing, internet is everywhere, smartphones are common, um, are fundamentally changed by this. So the idea is that they process information differently than those of us who came to these technologies later in life. And among some, it's even kind of a, a deep metaphor. It's almost like a person's native language. So the idea is that, well, you have to use technology because if you don't, it's kind of like having somebody sit in a classroom with a foreign language. Um, it's just not, uh, it's not presenting information the way that they, they want and need. So how many people have heard of some variation of the digital native net gen? Yeah, all right, so this one, this one has caught fire uh, among many individuals. So I want us to, to think about this a little bit more deeply as well. Now, when I was thinking about presenting this, I, I uh, um, Remember back to this uh, very memorable quote, memorable to me, quote that uh, came from a person in the context of a discussion about technology in our lives. And I want you to read this over and then kind of summarize it for you. All right, so this individual was saying to me, you know, I, I'm from this big Italian traditional family and I don't like how technology impacts family life because we're having a get together and people are playing on their phones and I want to say just, you know, put the phone away and uh, let's pay attention to the people who are right here. So, you know, kind of a, a, a really ambivalent, um, if not outright negative, feeling about technology. Now, if you're kind of picturing, think for a second about picturing the individual who said this to me. They look like and what their age is. And the person who said this to me is about 22 years old, she's uh, Hillary. And she's a student in my Technology, Mind, and Brain senior capstone course. So the full context for this is that Hillary, you know, I had asked the students, um, you know, to kind of describe where they were on a continuum of how they felt about the impact of technology on their minds and in their lives. And a surprising number were either over on the extreme end of like, I don't like it, you know, I tolerate it, but I, I really question it. Good solid number are in the middle of, I see the strong points, you know, I like to use my phone, but sometimes I'm glad not to have it. Um, and then yes, there are those who say, this has had a tremendous uh, positive impact on humanity and all my life, and I can't imagine life without it. So I think what I'm trying to highlight here is the complexity of generational effects such as they are with respect to technology and interacting with technology. And then maybe we need to, to be a little bit more critical or skeptical about the idea that you just gotta have technology because the kids want it and need it, all right? So, you know, for example, uh, if you ask around your traditional age college students, you'll probably find, as many surveys do, that not all of them adore Facebook. So many of them avoid social media altogether, some of them over concerns about future employment, which are well-founded, by the way, um, some of them, it's personal preference. They just don't really like it that much. And I've, I've heard administrators say, well, we gotta put more stuff on Facebook because that's where the kids are. Well, not necessarily. Um, you know, and uh, some of them um, who are on Facebook a great deal, among those who do like um, to use computing throughout their lives, many of them we're finding out through, again, surveys these days, um, really do like to enforce a distinction between their work computing um, and school computing and their social computing. And they don't necessarily like to have those, those realms mixed up. Um, 
you know, there's, you even see this idea sometimes put out there as, well, this level of computer use really physically rewires the brain. They're, re re they're wired differently than us. And that's kind of a bigger debate, and we can have that one over lunch if you want, but suffice it to say, that the evidence for that level of the neural transformation is really weak, all right? So, you know, from a cognitive standpoint, does using computers change you so that you qualitatively think and act differently than a non-user or a non-native user? Maybe not. From a pragmatic standpoint, purely practical standpoint, this is also pretty counterproductive and that it leads us to overestimate just how much tech, or, uh, overestimate just how much technical expertise a young person is going to have in our online learning environments. All right, and again, from from the study of cognition, we know that it is remarkably difficult to get knowledge and skills to transfer from one domain to another. If you change the context of where learning or skills are used it oftentimes falls apart. So good transfer is the exception and not the rule. And I think that's what we're seeing in the students who, yeah, are having some level of computing that goes on for hours every day of their lives, but they don't know what to do when you throw them into that online course. So they have limited ability to solve problems. And I know my uh, computing and information sciences uh, colleagues, who I work with uh, quite a bit, they're constantly talking about this one, I'm saying, you know what, yeah, you do have to have a whole class on just how to use Office Suite to its full capabilities because they do not know. So don't assume from their age that they're going to be able to just take to it like a fish to water. Don't assume that a non-traditional age student is going to have a, have a fear of other problems with computers. So these generational effects I don't think are a good motivation to bring more technology to the courses. Um, Exploring other factors that should inform, and a few that shouldn't. So, hopefully we can kind of forget about traditional concepts of short-term memory in the sense that, you know, oh, you have some fixed arbitrary amount of information you can take in. Um, while a lot of that is research-based, again, it doesn't always underlie memory and memory performance in realistic situations. That said, it's a good design idea to think about you know, what working memory capabilities are being tapped as students are uh, getting into a learning activity or doing a particular thing online, right? Especially if you have two things going on at once that are tapping the same resource. Uh, so like trying to uh, read and listen to something verbal at the same time. Yeah, then you can get into an overload situation that's going to uh, cause decrements to performance. Here's two others from applied memory research um, that are really important, and these are some that we can absolutely take advantage of online. So first off, the testing effect. There are piles of research studies at this point that demonstrate that interacting with information um, in the form of taking a test, or anything test-like, is uniquely powerful for getting memory to stick. There's something about taking a test um, that uh, triggers a number of <laughs> beneficial underlying processes um, and creates a better memory payoff for time invested than pretty much anything else you can do. That said, research has also shown that students are fairly unlikely to hit on self-testing um, as a strategy spontaneously. It's something that it really helps to be able to press them to do. And this is a very robust effect. The memory effects uh, last uh, at least uh, months down the road, if not longer, so we've looked in a long-term context as well as a shorter term. Uh, it doesn't really matter what format, essay's good, multiple choice is good, even if you have tests without feedback, even if you don't tell them that the answer is right, uh, it can still be a very beneficial study activity. So this is why more people are turning away from that traditional idea of a test as a summative assessment to a critical learning opportunity. And with uh, giant test banks that we can now draw, we can create repeatable online quizzes, pre-reading quizzes. They're maybe not the sexiest thing that, or flashiest thing that we've ever heard of, but they are very, very powerful and research-based. Spacing effect. Um, this principle, also very well established in memory research, says that you know dividing up your study time into finer grain chunks produces better retention. So if you've got four hours to study, you're better off with four one-hour chunks in one big marathon session, um, and so forth. Unfortunately, the traditional class structure and scheduling is on the wrong side of this equation. 
right? Especially if you're trying to deliver uh, material in a compressed class format. But online, you can really force students by spreading out deadlines and creating small stakes assignments, you can force them to engage with material more regularly. Um, here's another, and this is gonna you know, upset some, some folks, but in the study of, of cognition, we found that it's really kind of a dead end to worry about matching learning style to presentation. So in the online environment, sure, you have the ability to really enhance what you do with visual diagrams, uh, audio narration, there's all kinds of ways to bring in sensory modalities. But yeah, the idea that there are these individual differences, say some people are visual learners and you gotta present it that way, other people are auditory learners, you gotta match that style does not seem to be that productive. People in general benefit from more sensory modalities and from variety. Many people are, uh, would call themselves highly visual. That's simply how human beings tend to process information. But matching to style uh, has, not, uh, has not worked out as a powerful principle. So seriously, yes. <laughs> that said, um, there's, I, I refer you to kind of the definitive source, Richard Mayer's research, um, if you want to know more about the finer points of when is it better to uh, you know, use something visual or something auditory, um, in a nutshell, a lot of his research points to the power of using more than one sensory modality to present information. Um, so a picture plus a narration will do better than a narration or a picture alone. But it's very important that those are meaningfully related. So you can't just take, say, a big block of text, decorate it with an irrelevant picture and say, voila, this is going to be really, really memorable. But things like, things like diagrams that people can explore while concurrently listening to an audio description can be very powerful. And, you know, lastly here, I think it's very important to stay focused on the why. Why we remember what we remember. So we are all getting away from the idea of thinking of memory as that sort of, uh, just sort of holding tank for information, and more is embedded intricately into the tasks that we accomplish to survive in our environment. And these are the things that we touched on with our little penny demonstration. You know, we remember things that are going to impact our future survival and do relate to our goals, everything else we don't. And that's a principle, again, that we can keep at top of mind as we design for our students. Now, when your mind doesn't remember something that's irrelevant, that you don't understand, that does not relate to prior knowledge and has no emotional punch to you, your brain's just doing its job, right? Just keeping out what's irrelevant and bringing in what is actually relevant. And so no wonder that our, when our students fail to engage, they also fail to remember. So think about the emotional punch, think about relating information to what's already in there, focusing attention and keeping students, uh, keeping things aligned with students' goals, and you can't go wrong. So again, thank you for your attention. This is going to be a very productive day, and I look forward to some questions. I'm just wondering, uh, you talked about the younger generation. Yeah. In the graduate schools, we have students that range mm -hmm. upwards of you know, 30, 40s, 50s, 60s, and yeah. so forth. Is there anything in the reverse, mm -hmm. not just in terms of technology, but in terms of mm -hmm. what they pay attention to mm -hmm. or, or how to make them pay? You know, we don't use a lot of testing, for example, in certain courses just simply because there are already adults that are out using the material, that kind yeah. of thing. So. Yeah, I think still um, the testing effect is so robust. I think that, that at any age, that is a productive use of time. And I think for a, a professional person who's maybe got more of that orientation of, how should I put it, using, using time and treating time as a precious resource, of making that pitch to them, saying, look, here's what you're going to get by investing this much time in a self-testing oriented strategy, re, you know, study approach, rather than passively rereading, which is kind of the default for at least younger college students. So I'm going to reread this material and that'll, that'll help me understand it and it'll make it stick. So I think there too, testing um, is also a productive approach. Now, as you get up into middle age and beyond, uh, Cognitively, and this is something I used to study is cognitive aging. Um, in that in that situation, um, yes, selective infer selective attention becomes somewhat more difficult. So, you know, a person who's more mature is going to have a harder time retaining information 
when it is, you know, when there's other irrelevant stuff that's competing. They'll still, they can still do very, very well, but those things are going to impact them, them relatively more. Um, there's also, you know, the time factor that uh, the person may need to invest a little bit more time, but as a person gets older, they get a lot smarter about being strategic and exploiting more information in the environment to help them encode in memory. So you may end up with not a net loss at all in a pra practical situation, but, a, but actually a net gain. So hopefully that's a, that's a few points to glean. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's fascinating that we have more classrooms that are populated by diverse age ranges and more diverse backgrounds. And that, yeah, we, but we still all have some, some fundamental principles that guide how we think and remember. All right, great question, yes. Yeah. Instruction. I'm wondering if your PowerPoint presentation was intentional in that you used black and white. Ah, well, you know, not so much the color. That's more of an aesthetic choice there. But yes, in the sense that, wow, when that you know, when we're talking over a PowerPoint with a lot of verbiage on it, yes, one's visual, one's auditory. However, they're both verbal. And you know, with reading as opposed to listening to speech, there are some extra you know, processes that have to be engaged. And there are some qualitatively different ways we process text as opposed to speech. However, we're still going to be drawing on those central resources in the mind and brain that help us figure out uh, sentences. And in fact, we're probably even sounding outwards even when we realize, don't realize we're doing it. So it's, it's almost like having two people trying to talk to the student at once. And we all know you really cannot do that. So yeah, I've become more attuned to, you know, what are we really competing with when people are required to read at the same time as they're listening? But those those diagrams again can be very powerful when you lay something out a little bit more visually, then the text can complement it. So, that, and uh, what was your impression? Not to put you on the spot, but does does that help a little bit? Not to have not to have as much text. Mm -hmm. um, I personally, I mm -hmm. was just I was curious about the design. Yeah. So yeah. That, Very good. Yeah. But not in a terribly bad way. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and I think I think more of us, and there are people, of course, from the design, not even kind of psychology, but from uh, the design field, who are radically re-examining how we use PowerPoint. That you know, PowerPoint these days gets dumped on a lot for for all of its its flaws and problems, but a lot of it maybe in how we use it, not in the not in the tool itself. Yes. Yeah, and you know, and they, I know uh, there's a probably correct folk belief that really teaching something to somebody um, is also uniquely powerful for memory. And I think that that is tapping into many of the similar things that we think that I need to respond, uh, that I get retrieval, we call it retrieval practice. So I'm retrieving the information I'm going to need and I'm doing it over and over. I mean, if I'm putting a paper together and drafting it properly, where I'm returning to that and revisiting it, I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be retrieving that information more. And also, I like that as well because you're retrieving it in a structured <coughs> fashion. We didn't talk about it too much, but you know, when we talk about meaning, part of meaning is is structure. Not having you know a bunch of facts that I tried to take away today, but how they all interrelate. So the human mind is very attuned to how, uh, how knowledge, pieces of knowledge interrelate with one another and we have very elaborate structures that develop as we become experts in a discipline. And so, yeah, I think papers are a good opportunity for that. Um, I, I've tried in some of my own paper assignments lately to also bring in the transfer issue and try to align more, uh, more explicitly with the type of writing that students will have to do in their environment when they, when they leave school. Um, in my case, it's leaving to go to a graduate program or certain kinds of work environments, and I could try to pitch it to be more similar to those. So I, I get that as well. So getting some practice in the writing they'll have to do in the future, they're structuring their knowledge, they're having to do a very difficult retrieval and memory task as well. 
So it's it's good stuff. Labor intensive. And, and, and thank you so much, folks. Okay. Dr. Miller's going to be with us all day and at lunch. So if you ask more questions, please join me during a round of applause. Thank you.